but thanks a lot to the organizers for um, giving me a chance to talk here today. Uh, it's been a while, it's great to see people again. Uh, I've been coughing a bit last weekend, so to be on the safe side, I actually took a rapid test, I'm good, in case I'm coughing, uh, <laughs> should be safe. <laughs> uh, my voice is still uh, a bit scratchy, but otherwise I think I'm good. So I will be talking about non-abelian symmetries in tensor networks, and in particular the open source tensor library QSpace as of version four. So QSpace has been many years in the making. Uh, it has been highly scrutinized over some 15 years by now uh, in many, many collaborations, applications, mostly centered around the group of Jan van Delft in Munich. But there have been many uh, projects, PhD projects that excessively, extensively uh, used, made use of QSpace, and some of the uh, uh, grad students or postdocs also took uh, QSpace along uh, when they moved to other places. More recently, the development of QSpace core libraries, as I referred to them uh, on my behalf, moved to Brookhaven National Lab, where in terms of applications, there's been also uh, uh, work already together with Alexei Trelik, uh, Robert Kolik. Um, so QSpace has been closed source up to version three and upon numerous requests and also in order to save grad students many, many, a lot of time trying to code it themselves, I finally decided uh, to make QSpace as of version four uh, open source for the time being. Uh, it is in a uh, Git directory on big bucket under my name. Brief outline. I will give a general motivation, general aspects of tensors, role of symmetries, comparison to existing tensor libraries and approaches to non-abelian symmetries. Then talk a bit more in detail about non-abelian symmetries in tensor network representation. We'll focus on outer multiplicities, contractions, and X symbols, and their relation then uh, to six J symbols. And throughout the talk, I will comment on the Q space bottom-up approach uh, in that uh, I will make reference to generally well-known concepts of tensor networks but from the perspective of actually uh, having non-abelian symmetries in mind. Uh, summary and outlook. So tensor network simulations require tensor network library. It's a fairly trivial statement. Uh, so you can write it yourself or you use it uh, from somebody else. Generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, tensor networks is just an application in linear algebra and the elementary routines are simple. So there's nothing fancy on it from a conceptual point of view. So when it's using tensor products to build many body state space, uh, when it's doing contractions to compute matrix elements or expectation values, uh, when it's performing SVD for controlled truncation uh, and other single tensor operations like conjugation, permutation, reshapes, etc. So this by itself is all very simple and if one uses something like whatever MATLAB, uh, this can be done uh, just in a few lines that way. But this is limited in terms of dimensionality. If you want to simulate a physical model, you need to go up in dimensionality and you hit the wall pretty quickly in the patience and the numerical resources uh, in, in the type of calculations that you actually can do for uh, doing physics simulations. So then fairly quickly, one is looking out uh, for symmetries and the major benefit of symmetries is, is numerical efficiency. But aside from numerical efficiency, it also gives detailed physical information. For example, if you compare finite size spectra uh, to low energy CFTs in terms of uh, symmetry, symmetry labels of, of eigenstates. But on a more mundane level, it also gives insight for just turning on and off symmetries. So if there's something like spontaneous symmetry breaking in a system, uh, if you can turn off an SU2 symmetry by reducing it just to U1 symmetry, for example, you might learn something about the low energy or ground state physics uh, of your problem. Yet, uh, thinking about symmetries uh, in the implementation, there's significant overhead in the bookkeeping, and so you don't want to reinvent the wheel uh, yourself, and so you would like to have an efficient set of tensor libraries. They should work for arbitrary rank tensors, so then you can perform arbitrary tensor network type simulations such as NRG, DMRG, three tensor networks, ITVD, PEPS, or whatever. Uh, and so there's existing tensor libraries out there, but they are mostly predominantly centered around abelian symmetries such as U1, cyclic symmetry Zn, or parity symmetry C2 for fermions. And the dominant player in there is the I tensor library by Staudenmeier, 2010. As far as I understand, this goes back also to source code by Steve White and has seen significant updates since in terms of usability in terms of open source 
uh, other libraries such as Unit 10, like how 2015 and many, many others. It's only you have done it yourself one way or the other. And as a side note, QSpace version one actually by 2006 also had Abelian symmetries uh, implemented that way. There's few libraries that can actually deal with SU2 symmetry. Uh, so there's the Matrix Product Toolkit, which builds on source code by Ian McCallagh, as I understand, 2002. There's an MPS2 library in the quantum chemistry context by Wooders et al. 2013. And then not necessarily in terms of a tensor library, but more in terms of an approach. There's the approach of using 6J symbols. So this was done by Singh Pfeiffer et al. 2010, and closely related in terms of fusion trees more recently by Schmoll Oros 2020. But for more general non-abelian symmetries, meaning just talking not just SU2, but for example, SUN, there's basically no tensor library whatsoever available that way. Uh, so approaches that have been used for general, more general non-abelian symmetries has been on the variational wave function uh, type setting, where one just assumes fixed bond dimensions. So you just constrain yourself to a fixed set of multiplets on bonds, and then the overhead in terms of klebsch gordon coefficients is manageable and can be done, and so this was done, for example, in Mabrini, Adal, Poiblanc, uh, 2016, 2017. And there's exact diagonalization for SUN by Nataf, Adal, 2014, and who generalized it then to SUN DMRG, uh, 2018. But this is also fairly specific to the DMRG, and as I understand, uh, there's no concept of a tensor library per se that this can be generalized to. And then lastly, there's QSpace version two, which since 2012 actually knows to do non-abelian symmetries on a fairly generic level. Let me briefly comment on the general role of symmetries in a nutshell. So this is my standard slide in that regard. If you have abelian symmetries, uh, you get a sparse Hamiltonian. So many matrix elements are simply forbidden by symmetry. And so you only have a sparse set of non-zero matrix elements, which can be condensed, can be grouped together uh, to make it block diagonal. So you have an, an outer sum of these blocks. And because the blocks are significantly smaller than the original large matrix, uh, this gains significantly numerical performance. If you have non-abelian symmetries, this, this adds on top the feature that many of the non-zero matrix elements are actually dependent of each other uh, via wigner agnes theorem. So there's klebsch gordon coefficients that relate many non-zero klebsch gordon uh, matrix elements to each other. Uh, and so instead of writing just a block as here, one gets a tensor product of reduced matrix element times klebsch gordon coefficients. Because I'm always talking when I talk non-abelian symmetries, I talk about continuous non-abelian symmetries. Uh, this means you have infinitely many continuous symmetry operations. And on a hand-waving label, it also makes clear that everything that acts in terms of symmetry has to be split off. So the reduced matrix element no longer responds to symmetry operations, but to the infinite number of continuous symmetry operations that you could have. In principle, this is split off as a klebsch gordon coefficient. On the rank two level for the Hamiltonian, the klebsch gordon coefficient is trivial. It's the identity matrix. Uh, and so you get degeneracy. So if you have a lot of degeneracy, it is an indication uh, you have a large symmetry working. Uh, because I'm talking about symmetry labels on a more generic level, I usually prefer the labels QQC instead of SSC for SC2, uh, just to emphasize, in a sense, this can be uh, generic uh, symmetry labels. If one talks about uh, state space fusion, for example, if you have an A tensor that fuses left and bottom into Q3 out here, and also there you have the same concept that you have reduced matrix elements, uh, which can be set by the physics. So here you have arbitrary numbers that you can fill in, but the Klebsch-Gordon part is, is split off. The Klebsch-Gordon part is purely mathematical, has nothing to do with the physics, but it's, it's a tensor that you can split off. And by splitting off a tensor, this means you can reduce dimensionality. And so this means you move from a state space description uh, to a multiplet based description in terms of reduced matrix elements. So fairly generically, also by contractions of such tensors, this works for arbitrary rank tensors that you can write a tensor in terms of a reduced matrix element, tensor klebsch gordon coefficients for every symmetry that you're using. This also can be implemented for abelian symmetries. They have trivial klebsch gordon coefficients, but fits the same framework that way. Uh, point to make here is that the klebsch gordon coefficients always sparse, highly sparse, uh, and so it actually pays to store them in a sparse format. Uh, very general considerations on tensors. So as you all know, a uh, tensor is a coefficient space with indices. So for example, you might write tensor this way that you have a bunch of legs like left, top, right, bottom, and some local index that you have there and you have coefficients A, L, R, T, B, S. Uh, now, uh, the number of legs that you have there I refer to as the rank of the tensor. 
So this is a rank five tensor, for example, as shown here. Uh, but now, also with symmetries in mind, orthogonality of state spaces in mind, every leg has a direction, has, has, a, has, an, has an arrow to it. So in a sense, if you have a tensor, there are states that, m that move in and there are states that move out. So there are states that are fused in, this is the input space, there's an output space. Uh, and this is completely equivalent, uh, if you remember your, your, your classes as a student, uh, so there's co-contravariant concept for tensors, so this is completely equivalent. So there's a binary classification, so it's either in or out, or it's either an, a raised index or a lowered index, however you use it, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. And so directionality uh, is very important if one considers uh, tensor networks, and so that's why I typically like to see arrows uh, on every leg. Now, uh, in terms of arrows, once more, they're closely related. Uh, also to bracket notation, for example, if you calculate the matrix element, uh, then all the, the outgoing indices uh, show up here to the right, uh, then the operator AX, and then you project on all the incoming indices as well. Uh, and so again, in terms of bracket, there's either bracket, there's no other thing in terms of states. Again, there's a binary classification that way. Now, in terms of symmetry, symmetry is, by definition, if you have a multiplet, you, you would like to refer to an independent orthogonal state space. So there's questions that arise if you, have, if you have cycles in your tensor network, but assuming that you have a three tensor network or whatever, then you always have perfectly orthonormal state space that a particular index uh, refers to. And so it makes sense then to introduce symmetry labels, to categorize that state space in terms of symmetry labels, and this means you always get a composite index. So instead of a single index, you always have a natural three label structure uh, for any index. So you, point one, you need to specify what symmetry sector, what's the multiplet, Q. Then within that symmetry sector, you may have many multiplets. You need to specify which multiplet, so this is the N. And then the multiplet itself has internal structure, which is, is indexed by QC. And so this is fairly generic and natural, that way that one acquires this composite index structure. So when one has, once one has imposed symmetries, one gets a natural block decomposition in terms of all the symmetry combinations that are permitted. And so in terms of U1, for example, just all the incoming charge needs to e e be equal to the sum of the outgoing charge. Uh, arrows on a leg are well-defined, but you can revert an arrow. And so you can raise an index, you can lower an index, and equivalently, uh, you can change the direction of an arrow. So on a single leg, the direction is well-defined. I cannot just change on the fly. But you can insert an object like A in here, and then on the right-hand side, indeed, the arrow can point in the opposite direction. Uh, by definition of it, of it of with symmetries in mind, if you have rank two, then if you have the multiple Q here, this must be the dual Q bar. Because only the Q with tensor Q bar can uh, generate a singleton dimension, which then can be skipped. Uh, and so in terms of dual variation, just as a reminder, SU2 is self-dual, so S bar is just S. But for example, on the U1 side already, the dual of Q is minus Q, because in order to annihilate charge, if you have a positive charge, it only can be annihilated by a negative charge that way. And so this type of object that's drawn here actually relates to what's referred to as a, a one chase symbol. So there's only, only one symmetry label that you have in here, namely Q. This is already fixed, fixed as Q bar, and this is the zero. So this is what's referred to as a one chase symbol. One can use this to introduce actually a unitary transformation that flips the arrow. You can insert it twice. You have U, U dagger. And so on the outside, you still have arrow pointing to the right, but in the mid middle, you already have it pointing to the left. You can move the two tensors left and right to the side, and then you have reverted uh, the arrow uh, on a leg. Are it usable operators? Uh, so how do you represent operators? It's very closely related to multiplets. And the simple way to see that is by looking at the operation of symmetry operations on a, on a, on a state space. So if I have a symmetry multiplet, you have raising, lowering operators on it, well, it, you get a C plus minus one. So that's uh, what you know uh, from the quantum mechanics class. On the other end, you can write the spin multiplet as written here as the creation operator of that spin state on the vacuum state. Uh, then you can write it like this. You can move the S plus minus operator to the right via the commutator, and then it's annihilated by the vacuum state. And so you see what has been uh, written here is the, the standard form acting with a symmetry operation on, an, on a state uh, becomes equivalent to acting on, a, on, an, on an operator via a commutator. And so what you're familiar with as an, as an I-reducible multiplet, 
uh, as an IREP on the state space becomes an IROT usable operator, an IROP that when it has precisely the same symmetry label as you're also familiar with uh, in, in the state space context. Uh, in this sense, uh, like a multiplet which has internal dimension, an IROT usable operator also consists of a spinner. It has several components to it, so it naturally acquires a third index. It's an operator index. By convention, I use it as a third index. So there's a local state space, for example, that it acts on, and then there's the operator index. Uh, that it has. So it has an, this is a very natural way of writing operators, always rank three, with the exception if you have a scalar operator, which transforms like Q equals zero, then this is a single dimension, you can skip it, and then you just have a regular rank two operator that way. But in principle, it's still a uh, rank three operator with a single to the side. So then building one block at a time, you know how to write IROT usable operators, uh, you know how to write uh, state spaces, you can actually write a matrix product operator. So there's also quite extensive literature in this regard. And from an non-abelian point of view, the best way of looking at MPOs is as an MPS of operators. Uh, so you're all familiar with matrix product states. So we have a state space index here to the bottom. So usually you have an orthogonal state space of a local site here. But it doesn't have to be a state space. You can have an orthogonal set of operators down here. Then you just have an index here that says you have the first operator, second operator, third operator. So it's just an index. So again, this is a vector index into the operator space that labels your operators. You obviously have the identity in there, and then you might have a spin operator, has a different index in there, and so on. And so here, the operator label comes very natural because it actually acts like a state uh, into the MPS set here. And so you know how to write down an MPS for a particular combination. So if you find a number of non-zero coefficients in there, you just uh, uh, initialize the MPS this way. Uh, you can combine your local operator bases as far as you have it. Oops. Wrong direction. So, for example, the identity and the spin operator together. Uh, you have a complete basis. That way, in operator, uh, you can now contract it on this operator index and get a rank four object out of it. And then, putting it all together, you have an MPO out of this. So it's all built in, in, a, in a simple manner that way from, from things that you know. You know MPS, uh, you know how to write down an operator, you know how to do contraction, uh, you have your MPO. So we had used this uh, down here for, for thermal simulations. So you can write down an MPO for the Hamiltonian, it's a small step to write down, to initialize a density matrix this way. And then it's a simple small step to double the density matrix, and that's what we used in the XTRG approach down here for thermal simulations on, on quantum lattice models. Uh, tensor conjugation, so I also would like to comment on this one. It's a very simple concept, so all of you again are familiar with it. Uh, you just write down a matrix element. So you have a bunch, you have a, you have a bra state, you have a cat state, you have a bunch of operators in here, like creation and elation operators. And you just take the conjugate of it. And so what happens is the bra and cat state uh, take reverse order, move to the other side, the operators reverse order. And also you have to dag on every one of these objects. So also the, every individual tensor in there actually reverts. And so if you think about it, it's like putting a mirror in there. It's like you flip around the entire structure, and what you get out of it in terms of a number, uh, you take complex conjugate of it. On a pictorial level, you're also familiar with it. Uh, for example, if you take in an MPS, if you take an A tensor and, and you take, calculate the overlap with itself, uh, then what you do is typically you draw a picture of this type. It means you have this tensor, the precisely the same tensor down here, but the A dagger down here, the conjugate tensor, is created by taking the mirror image by reverting all arrows, because only an outgoing arrow can meet an incoming arrow. And then you still uh, complex conjugate actually the matrix elements if they happen to be complex. Uh, and so this is the same concept also that underlies, for example, fermionic PEPs by Corbeau et al., where the argument there relies on the similar fact that if you write down a cat state, complicated tensor network for the cat state, that for the bra state, you take the mirror image. And then you can reshape that one, but the starting point is you start with the mirror image that way, and it's all taken conjugate tensors, basically, by taking mirror image. Uh, one can play similar games in terms of mirror image for operators themselves, but for the time being, we leave that one. So a major uh, 
for what operator? Meaning that you, you take the conjugate twice and you get a minus sign. Um, so here, yeah. this is really on the computational level. Like if you, if you uh, this uh, concept here is, is generic that way. So, I mean, there's, I don't see any complication in this type of setting. Uh, you have a basis transformation, you can squeeze an operator in there. Uh, so you have, you have to be careful if lines are crossing. Uh, if lines are crossing, then for example on the fermionic side, uh, you get ferric. Uh, Ian was asking probably that if, if, you, if, if prime reversal is not defined as being taking the dagger, but there's additionally some gate transform. This is what happens in SU2. That the, the, uh, the conjugate, you have to put next to the sigma wider. Right. Yeah. Implement it yeah. explicitly by an extra sigma. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm I'm not talking about applying a time reversal symmetry operation here. This is a regular local operator uh, that you're applying uh, that way. Uh, so it's a state description that you have, the operator representation, uh, and you take uh, 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 quite frequently, you need to consider bra end cap uh, that way. And that's always implicitly what you're doing. Okay, we, we can talk about it. Yes. So a major headache for non-abelian symmetries is outer multiplicity. Uh, and let me comment about this, about this in more detail. So typically you can write down a tensor reduced matrix element times Kirch Gordon coefficient. And so this means you have reduced matrix element tensor and you have a Kirch Gordon tensor. And they share exactly the same structure. Two in, in two indices in, two indices out, uh, same index order, like this way. Now if you think about the Kirch Gordon tensor, uh, how do you build a rank four Clebsch Gordon tensor? Uh, you can contract uh, rank three tensors as you know them. For example, you could fuse one and four into some intermediate spin multiplet, for example, SI, uh, and then split them again into two and three. Uh, and so this way, if you contract on the intermediate index in terms of Clebsch Gordon tensors, you get another rank four Clebsch Gordon tensor. Also, by contraction, you can get arbitrarily large Clebsch Gordon tensors. Uh, and so the intermediate multiplet in here can, can be different, could be different ones. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't know the internal structure, uh, this translates to multiplicity. It means from this tensor you have multiple versions of it that have exactly the same symmetry labels on the outside, but different clip coordinate coefficients. Yeah, you can make them orthogonal to each other with respect to the index field. So this can, you can have an orthonormal basis in outer multiplicity. Then. And so that means, actually, what you have, if you have outer multiplicity, is that you can have some superposition in terms of coefficients W here in the, in the clip squared space that connects to the reduced matrix element. And for every such combination, you can have another uh, reduced matrix element tensor. That way. Uh, it means it does not, outer multiplicity does not increase dimensionality of the tensor here, but it gives you more coefficients. It gives you more knobs to turn in, you know, in a physical setting. So there's more reduced matrix elements that you have. Uh, if you make sure that, the, that, the, that what you're linking to is actually orthogonal uh, clebsch gordon spaces, uh, then this puts constraints on the W, it can be an orthogonal transformation, so it shouldn't be singular that way, uh, not parallel vectors uh, in a sense. And then the sum over the mu that you have here is already indicated as such is an actual sum. So actually, you do not have a clean tensor product you actually have a tensor product that has this W matrix as coefficients in between, and this is an actual contraction. Now the multiplicity space. So there's now the multiplicity index comes out of <laughs> the clebsch gordon tensor, uh, links to a coefficient W that can be an arbitrary transformation in there, and the clebsch gordon tensor is fully fixed by symmetry. And so then, if you have reduced matrix element W clebsch gordon tensor, in principle, you can, you can contract the W into reduced matrix elements, uh, uh, so you can get rid of it. Uh, and the klebsch gordon tensor is just symmetry. You can compute it once and for all, put it aside. You can tabulate it. You don't have to recompute it all the time. You don't have to store it uh, with your tensor. And so in terms of Q-space version history, in Q-space version two, I was still storing the klebsch gordons explicitly with the tensor, but it was overhead. I mean, it's, it's up to coefficients in here that keep rotating. Uh, 
uh, one can put them mostly aside. And so by Q-space version three, uh, this was calculated, calculated once and for all, uh, then looked up. And Q-space version four, actually, I still had previously kept the individual new components separate in Q-space, but actually introduced an explicit outer multiplicity index also in the reduced matrix uh, element. And so the generalized square coefficients tends to the orange things here, this part down here. Computed once and for all, dynamically on demand, tabulated, stored on the hard drive and reference. Now, to my knowledge, there is, there is no analytical way of ordering in outer multiplicity space uh, in a systematic fashion. Uh, so on the SC2 side, if you have standard rank, uh, rank three clutch ones, you have the you have the freedom of a phase. Uh, that's the only freedom that you have. You can introduce a phase convention. If you have outer multiplicity, this could be an arbitrary orthogonal notation. Uh, and so this introduces significant arbitrariness. And so I'm not aware that there's a systematically motivated way of fixing that arbitrariness. And so from the point of view of Q space. Uh, well, the, the, the arbitrary, it's arbitrary, but fixed. So whatever you choose as an algorithm, uh, you get a particular sequence out of it, and you stick to that sequence, and you insist on that sequence. Uh, and so that, uh, that ensures consistency. Uh, and so just to point out that there's no to motivate why it might be difficult uh, to have a systematic way of, of sorting uh, the multiplicities, that you can have arbitrarily large outer multiplicity on the SU3 level already for the rank three tensor. And let me remind you on the SU3 side, in terms of symmetry labels, you always have two labels, not just one as an SU2. So in terms of a young tableau, you take the offsets in the young tableau, you have a P, you have a Q, this is your label PQ. This defines the multiplet. PQs are non-negative integers, but arbitrary. Otherwise, uh, one can carry over the same to the SU2 side, just count the number of boxes, then Q is just 2S. And that's also Q-space convention, because it's kind of nicer, easier uh, to list just integers as compared to having half integers. Uh, and so then, for example, taking P equals Q equals N, meaning I have the representation NN. If I have the, the representation 1, 1, for example, is the edge representation, it's the spin operator, and the SU3 side is the eight dimensional representation. <laughs> so if I take representation NN and fuse it with another uh, uh, multiplet NN, I always also get out NN as a multiplet amongst other multiplets, but the multiplicity is N plus 1. So if I make n ever larger, I can drive up the outer multiplicity arbitrarily large. So whatever you can introduce as a permutation symmetry or inversion symmetry, whatever, this is going to be insufficient because outer multiplicity can be arbitrarily large to that level. Uh, and so there is arbitrariness in, in terms of Q space. It's fixed uh, by the procedure of how it's generated. So as, a, as an exemplary Q space output, you may ignore the first line for the time being. I'm actually doing this tensor product by forming the identity uh, between the 1-1 one, one multiplet and the 1-1 one, one multiplet and getting out the sequence of multiplets. So this is a listing. You, don't, you always just keep the non-zero blocks in your setting. So there's five entries in the list. Uh, this part describes multi the uh, dimensions of multiplets, how many multiplets you have. This describes the dimension of the multiplets themselves. Uh, this gives the symmetry labels, and you ignore, can ignore that part for the time being. It's, it's a tensor product with ordering 1, 2, and 3. So 1, 1 comes in, 1, 1 comes in, and stuff comes out. Uh, so in terms of indicating this, uh, the star indicates going out. No star means going in. So there's in and out uh, in terms of order convention. You see there's a 1, 1 multiplet always coming in, another 1, 1 multiplet always coming in. It's one multiplet. There's always a 1 here. Uh, but the one one that's going out, there's two of them. And so if you form the identity that way, you have to be aware that the second multiplet that's generated is an actual multiplet. So it really shows up uh, on the three side here in the reduced mat matrix element sector. So you really have a one times one times two as a reduced matrix element, as a re reduced matrix element tensor in here. Uh, while on the other ones, you only generate one of these multiplets, so this trading times one is, is skipped as a singleton. So there would be times one, times one here, so they don't see these. But you see it's larger than one, so you have a times two here. You see the outer multiplicity uh, in the one, one. 
And every one of these outer multiplicities are links in a particular uh, way as a, a linear superposition to the outer multiplicity in the Klebsch Gordon tetra. There's another uh, trading dimension too. This is the outer multiplicity trading dimension that comes in here uh, that links to the Klebsch Gordon tensor also on the outer multiplicity uh, index. So this is always what the green line uh, what's, is, becomes visible here. And yes, you, you mentioned your convention from outer multiplicity just depends on the way this is generated. Uh, can you expand a little bit how you generate it? Uh, so on the on the level of of rank three tensor, so this is standard Klebsch Gordon coefficients. And so I start with the defining representation. I, I will come back to this later, but I might skip it later then. Uh, so you start with the defining representation, uh, you know how to write it down. You build the tensor product of the tensor of the of the defining with itself. You do a few cycles, uh, so you generate a bunch of multiplets that are still smallish. And typically it's efficient to represent the local state space. And so when you do a simulation in tensor networks, you don't have the full thing in a single goal. You always build, if you have a matrix product state, you start from the left end. You have a vacuum state, you add a site. You add a site. You build the state space. And when you build the state space, you get ever larger multiplets. And so it's this iterative approach uh, that generates ever larger multiplets on the fly. You, you don't just, there's not just a large multiplet showing up out of, out of nowhere. It has to be constructed because the way you build the Hilbert space, it, it's constructed that way. It comes out this way. And so it's, it's, it's a bottom-up approach this way, and it's, it's, you, you won't be able to compute all of this in a single flight because as you do, it's infinitely many multiplets, so you, you are restricted. At some point in time, your calculation might reach a point where it asks for something you haven't computed yet, then you basically have to compute it on the fly that way. Uh, so the klebsch gordon coefficients that I'm computing this way uh, is when, the, when there's at least one multiplet which is smallish, in the sense that it's plausibly a local multiplet. I never compute, if I have large multiplets, I do not compute the actual uh, uh, tensor product decomposition. So I also, one can also can obtain uh, rank three tensors by contractions. So that's typically, if you think about it, what you do in an MPS side setting, you always have a, a little index uh, that's showing up at some point in time. Uh, and so you can have, uh, so for the SC2 side, everything is plain and simple. But for larger SU and multiplets become big and fat. And so there you think twice if you really want to do the tensor product decomposition. So there's, there's various ways of building this. The preferential way is, is full tensor product decomposition. Uh, but in specific contexts, one also can resort to, to actually build it uh, via contraction. It comes out of a contraction. And then outer multiplicity might not be complete because it didn't do all the possible contractions. So later on, if you do a contraction, uh, you might double check uh, when projecting, did, did something change on the way? Did you already compute it or was something updated? If something was updated, you have to recompute it, you might generate a new outer multiplicity component. And so outer multiplicity that way is also built on the fly. Uh, so now having the 2-2 two, two representation here, from the 1-1 one, one I generated to 2-2, two, two, I also can generate, for example, 2-2 two, two times 10 to 2-2, two, two, get a longer list even. So again, everywhere, the input multiplets are just 2-2. Two, two. And again, get out the 2-2 two, two multiplets now three times. Right, so it's n plus one, n was two, so you get three of these multiplets out. You have to account for them, there's explicit multiplets, and they link to the multiplicity space uh, in the klebsch gordon coefficient. And by looking at the dimension of the multiplet, so the two, two multiplet has dimension 72, uh, that's what you see in this row down here, and the multiplets that come out here, the singleton dimension has, the scalar has dimension one, uh, and the largest dimension actually you get out of it, in this case is already just adding up the labels, two, two plus two, two is four, four is 125. So this, this is multiples you do of a size that you usually do not encounter if you use SU2. And so on the SU3 side, well, on the SU2 side, you have multiples typically up to dimension 10 in the calculation. On the SU3 side, fairly quickly, you reach multiples up to dimension of 100. And for SUN, you fairly quickly reach multiples up to dimension 10 to the n minus 1. Uh, so the, the typical multiple size grows exponentially with the n. And so while n is a parameter in Q space, uh, there are significant uh, there's, there's order of magnitude difference, orders of magnitude difference if you go from n to n plus one in SUN. Uh -huh. uh, so if it's a, 
if this is a single if this is a single number, so this is like a listing of variables, like you have in MATLAB, right? Uh, so if it's a single number, I show it. If it's a so this is a one times one times one, so it's a number. So I show that number because it's an identity tensor. It's a one. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones, but then there's here I have a one times one times two times two. This is a block, and so it has 32 bytes. Uh, it's it's like size. It's uh, whatever. It's like you do listing of a variable. Uh, uh, I wrote something there. And as I like to point out, I, I Q space is a bottom up approach. You play Lego. Uh, you have small pieces you know, and then you put things together uh, to have a more complex on the way. You start from stuff you know, and then you build, and you build on, on top of it. Uh, and so as previously pointed out, I start with a defining representation, iterate, and then what one typically starts is get local space. You start with a de description of the local site. How do you describe a local site? Well, it has a state space, but actually Q space doesn't know state space, it only knows operators, so when you call get local space, it returns an operator that describes that site. It might return a spin operator, might dis uh, return creation annihilation operators if you have fermions, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and so, I, again, noting on the rank, uh, it's a tensor library. It's not describing a leg, it's describing a tensor, and the tensor always has at least two legs. Or zero legs if you contract it in full, but there's no such thing as a tensor with one leg. Because in terms of symmetries, what, what comes in has to go out, so there's a contradiction. Uh, and, and so in that sense, also, that uh, if you describe a state space, like a local state space, you get an operator that acts in it, and not uh, actually a vector space. Uh -huh. And so when you call get local space on the spin in SU3 in the defining one zero representation, you get back the spin operator looks like this, for example. So you have uh, index order convention one, two, the operator index is on the third, so it acts on, a, on, a, on, a, on the defining multiplet, and the spin operator transforms in the adjoint representation, so it's a one, one. Uh, Q space adheres to norm convention, so it has the proper, it corresponds to the correct uh, Casimir operator that way. Uh, one can generate spin operators for larger multiplets, so there's a caveat in the sense that the spin operator is defined, you might define it with a different sign uh, to start with in defining representation, but any spin operator I that acts in a larger multiplet is fully fixed by what you do in the defining representation. And a simple way of seeing this, you always can build a larger multiplet by defining representations, build the total spin of it and calculate its matrix elements, you can compute it uh, in a well-defined manner. There's, there's no freedom. Uh, that way. And so, for example, if you calculate the spin operator in the 1 1 representation, even though there's a multiplicity of two, you only have one operator because the spin operator is well defined. There's actually another operator in the adjoint representation, but it's not the spin operator. And, and so, the particular coefficient uh, space that they have in, there in terms of the, the, the Klebsch Gordon tensor that you chose, the particular convention that you had in outer multiplicity space, uh, sticks in here. It needs to be consistent. Then also the adjoint of your uh, for the for this spin operator. What that you take, or how do you deal with this? Uh, so I, I start with the spin operator in the defining representation, and this with this I can reach any other multiplet, a tensor product, including the the U of. Is it true for any Lie group? For the ones I'm considering, as far as I know, yes. So I'm using simple Lie algebras, S U N, S P two and S O to N to N plus one. Exceptional ones. Huh? Like the exceptional ones? I, I, I haven't come yet across my mind. Uh, so I, 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 for the for the symmetries I'm considering in terms of of simple standard Lie algebra. So it's A B C uh, in B and uh, in Lincoln notation. Uh, so for all of these, I I am pretty confident this should work. Uh, and in particular, if you take actually the spin operator in the dual representation here. What I had shown, what I had shown previously, actually there's a, 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 a change in sign. You cannot just take the dagger of this one, but actually for the spin operator in the dual representation, not just in one zero, but zero one, actually you get a sign in there. And so there's subtleness uh, that one needs to be aware of. Uh, my five minutes are over. Uh, 
Ah, that's a thing. Because only three minutes should work like this. So, okay, I'm trying to make it short. Automotive multiplicity grows exponentially with tensor rank. Uh, so if the more legs you have, automotive multiplicity becomes fat. Uh, but in any case, it's never a good idea to have a high rank tensor object. It's not good in non-abelian symmetries, it's not good in abelian symmetries, it's not good in no symmetries at all. Uh, because that's what you know from DMG, because you don't have a large coefficient tensor, but you split it up as a tensor train as an MTS. So you would like to have lower rank representation, the same uh, strictly also applies uh, there. There's many ways how you convince yourself, uh, but in particular, that's also the case for uh, uh, non-abelian symmetries, also phylogenetically. So you would like to keep the fine-grained tensor network, or if you have to build something like this, you would like to fuse indices, meaning you take a reshape, basically, uh, of the tensor. Yeah, this is actually still an important part that I wanted uh, to discuss in some detail. So this, this slide, I will still go through that, right? In terms of contraction, if you do tensor network, you need to contract. Uh, contraction is pairwise. And so you have two tensors, A and B, you contract them on a bunch of indices. Having Klebsch-Gordon's, having non-abelian symmetries in mind, you have a juice matrix elements, Klebsch-Gordon coefficient, and you have exactly the same structure of contraction on the reduced matrix element side and on the Klebsch-Gordon side. Now, if you take the contraction on the Klebsch-Gordon side, uh, once you do the contraction, you have a rank four tensor, and this is limited. It doesn't have arbitrary large outer multiplicity. And so you basically can project uh, the contraction in the Klebsch-Gordon space uh, to this uh, complete uh, Klebsch-Gordon tensor you already have. So you can insert the identity by inserting E dagger E. And then what you have at the end of the day is the full contraction of the tensor that you have on store that you contract fully with the contraction of the two Klebsch-Gordon tensors that you have. And actually what's not contracted is the outer multiplicity index. So this one's stick, still sticking out there. So this full contraction is what I refer to as an X symbol out of light of imagination, X for contraction. Uh, so this is contracting Klebsch-Gordon tensors, and this also can be tabulated uh, that way. And once you insert it at the top, then this means you no longer, if you have the X symbol for the complete outer multiplicity, that's all you need. You look it up if you have it. You need to contract it on the reduced matrix element tensors but you can reference the Klebsch-Gordon tensor again. So you don't no longer need to, to load a huge Klebsch-Gordon tensor. All you need is the X symbol. Well, I just read that uh, the bond dimension, the fat uh, green bond dimension is smaller than two. Uh, two Typically small. significantly smaller. So unless you have a high rank tensor, then the, the, the dimension of the outer multiple is also grows. But for rank four, everything, I'm very confident this is much smaller than what you have up here, in particular for larger symmetries. Uh, and so in that sense, an X symbol represents a rank three tensor that purely operates in outer multiplicity. So in a sense, it's a three M symbol, uh, three outer multiplicity. It comes with significant metadata. It knows precisely which tensors went in. It knows precisely what was contracted. And if anything changed, like a permutation on the index or like different indices, you get a different X symbol. X symbols also, if, even if it's zero, it's stored because you, you don't necessarily know a priori uh, if it's zero or not. So if it's zero, even that is stored. Uh, and tabulated that way. Similar strategy, by the way, on the SU2 side also was employed, as far as I understand, by Werner Dow, uh, 2019. Uh, one, yeah, so the, one could compute six chase symbols, but in practice, one does not want to contract an entire pattern, but one wants to do pairwise contraction. And X symbols allows pairwise contraction. Like you would do contraction without any symmetries whatsoever, you do pairwise contraction. So that's a pretty, pretty convenient uh, approach this way. Uh, Q space knows I tags labeled legs, outer contraction syntax. Uh, it's a bottom up approach, uh, data structure, uh, and summary. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
I, I do it precisely the same way. I, I start with the defining representation, I take the tensor product of the defining representation with itself. And indeed, every representation has its generators. So I know about the simple rules, so I know about the raising and lowering operator. I start with the maximum weight state and sequence a multiplet out. Next multiplet, sequence it out. Next multiplet until there's no space left. You just explicitly generate the direct product space explicitly. It is known, like for all the D groups, as you have to know basically what are the largest weight. You have to, to know I the full representation I, theory. I have implemented it for SUN, SP2N, SO2N, SO2N does work. I think for now the statement is for those groups this works. And there might be more fancy groups where. One so one one comment in that respect, I'm referring to to continuous symmetries. Uh, where the multiplet, where I can compute the Klebsch Gordon coefficient space, where, where a multiplet has integer dimension. So if you consider something like Fibonacci anions, and I cannot do it because you don't have an integer uh, multiplet dimensions with something else. So this is still something uh, on my mind, maybe, of how to implement this one way or the other. This open source code that does that, no? I think Butel has like. Yeah, but this is six chain code. symbols, I would think, one way or the other. So, but the Klebsch Gordon approach, this bottom up approach, it seems somewhat ill-suited in that context. Josh, a short question. I have a technical question. Yeah. The, the way we do this SU2, SUN, is that we separate the MPS and then the Klebsch Gordon layers, and then we will do this kind of reconstruction so that uh, uh, when you do a U1 symmetry and then you do, do your DMRG, then the only modification is that you get some kind of scalar factors, as you also described, if you do these kind of separations. And then you also pre-calculate these at the beginning and save it in some table. Do you I, do I, also I something like that? I did not understand the question, to be honest. So we have this MPS layer, and then also a Klebsch Gordon layer. So that I, 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 you mean reduced market element layer and Klebsch Gordon layer? Exactly. So that what we do is that we just separate the Klebsch Gordon layer. Uh, as a, as it's, it's a two-level network what you have. So that Every tensor has reduced matrix element and Klebsch Gordons, oh. and they are linked by the multiplicity. Exactly. So that's what I'm just saying. That do you also pre-calculate these at the beginning, and then uh, some? I was just wondering to, to speed up calculations. But what we do that we have some pre-calculated databases from which this this pre-contracted pre uh, scalars can be taken from a, from some data base. So in terms of Klebsch Gordon tensors, uh, they are computed and stored and only loaded when needed. Mm -hmm. So if if the if the symmetry content has is if you repeat the same calculation a second time. And by definition, you already calculated everything you needed. Uh, then there's no longer a Klebsch Gordon tensor that's loaded. It only knows about fusion of a multiplet, what comes out and how many comes out. And it knows about excess contractions. I think, I think it's similar. OK. I, was, I think that if we, we do something similar in the sense that we don't have also the Klebsch Gordon tensors, but only the, the, some, some pre-contracted component. But let's discuss this later on. OK. Yeah. Maybe we'll move to the discussions to the coffee break. So one, one moment, so this is open source. The GitLab is available, but the documentation is still somewhat limited. So I'm planning to improve on that one. Uh, if there's questions during this week, feel free to ask me anytime.